Well, hello, everybody. It's right at two o'clock. So I think it's time for us to get this uh, party started. Hope you enjoyed the music we had playing for you to get things ready and kick this off. So with that, um, let's get going. So we're going to start with some welcome and introductions. Uh, I know we still have a few folks trickling in, it looks like we're slowly growing in the numbers. So we're going to um, go ahead and start knowing that some of you are going to be just signing on and joining us. Thank you. So with that, let's look at the next slide. Um, seeing that we have what? Wow, 24 folks here. Thank you so much. Um, some names I recognize. I'm so glad to see those of you I recognize. Oh my goodness. This is great. Thank you. So a little bit of housekeeping uh, just before we get started. Uh, you probably have all been using Zoom this year, so you're very familiar with the features, but in case there's someone who hasn't, use Zoom a lot. We want to give you a quick overview. Uh, so be sure that you look at the bottom bar on your screen on your control panel. You can mute yourself or hide your video using the microphone and camera buttons that you see there on the bottom left. So we encourage you to leave your video on if you can. We really like to see your face. We're sharing ours with you, so we want to see who you are. Um, and particularly when we're in small group breakouts, uh, which you're going to get to experience a lot of today so that we can facilitate the conversation by seeing each other's faces. So before we go much further, we also want to cover some norms for today. Um, so with that, if you'll go to the next slide for me, thank you so much. So what are we talking about with norms? Let's talk about first, be ready to be engaged. If you're like me, you've already turned off your cell phone um, so that you can be free of distractions to the as much as possible. We've turned off our email, so we want to give you that as a tip. Um, as we move into our small groups, we ask that you come with an open mind, be ready to share your ideas and share your experiences so that we can all learn together. Then at the end, we would appreciate it if you would take the time to let us know what worked and what we could do better. Uh, to make it a little more fun, uh, we started with music for those of you who are here early enough to get to hear that. Uh, and we will continue that theme with name that song and name that movie as we continue working together today. So we do have a packed agenda, so I'm going to be moving quickly as will all of my colleagues. I have the agenda for you on the screen, but just let me know, just let, we want to let you know that our role today is to bring you all together, facilitate a conversation, facilitate some learning or reminders, and that we're coming to you as supportive consultants, uh, helping you all learn, helping us learn from you about what your experiences are, how you receive the information we're sharing with you today. So this is definitely a collaborative opportunity to come together, learn and share our experiences and get to know one another a little bit better. It's going to be a workshop type experience um, where you hear from us and then we break into small groups and together share and reflect on a scenario. So if you think about virtual reality, we're gonna have a chance to experience a little bit of that virtual reality today. So who am I and who am I bringing to the table? Um, my name is Victoria Schaefer. I work with REL Appalachia and I'm joined by my colleagues who also uh, work on the REL project. You'll see us and hear from all of us today before uh, our three hours are done. Uh, CJ Park, Kathleen Dempsey, Ashley Campbell, Stephanie Suarez, and Ryoko Yamaguchi. So before we go any further, I want to tell you a little bit about the Regional Education Lab Program because the lab program is funding our work together today. So we want to honor that. We've color-coded a REL map for you. There are 10 RELs or regional ed laboratories operating in the United States. So we've color-coded the states so that you can see where all 10 are. We are those that are in the dark green or hunter green. We're coming to you from REL Appalachia today. We're going to share a bit of our work and, and you're going to get to hear from some of the folks that we are working with. We want to let you know what RELs do and what we do at REL Appalachia. There are three main things that RELs do. The first is applied research. The second is training, coaching, and technical support. And the third is dissemination. And uh, the project that you're going to be hearing from us on today has really done a little bit of all three of those. And you're going to get to see and feel a little bit of that experience. So these are our four states enlarged. 
And uh, we are coming to you from the post-secondary transitions partnership and the work that we've been doing in Kentucky specifically. So I do wanna pause and let you know who we brought with us. So we're so happy uh, that many, if not all of the folks on the screen are here with us. And you're gonna be hearing from them in just a moment. We have Jennifer Carroll from the Kentucky Valley Education Cooperative, Paul Green, who's a superintendent at Jackson Independent School District in Kentucky. And then we have three principals, Michelle Ritchie at Perry County Central High School, Chris Meadows at McGoffin County High School, and Noel Crum at Johnson Central High School. Like I say, you're gonna hear from them in just a minute. But before you do, I wanna ground us deeply in the overarching theme of the work that we're gonna be talking to you about today and where it was born in Eastern Kentucky with the folks I just uh, shared with you on screen. So first, let's uh, move up to the 30,000 foot level. What is continuous improvement? So continuous improvement is a process to increase the effectiveness or efficiency of a system where you're making small scale changes that are repeated um, over and over again, and they're evaluated each time. So we often see what I've got showing on screen right now, plan, do, study, and act. And that's a four-step process. And I would love it if I could see, I'm gonna scan, raise your hand if you're familiar with that process. I see some of you have your faces hidden. Over the course of today, we would love it. I see some thumbs up. Yes, use your chat function, you can say yes. We would welcome knowing that this is um, somewhat familiar to you. I see some other folks. Yes, great, thank you. So we've changed it just a little bit for our work and we wanna let you know how we did that. You're familiar with the four phases, many of you, I see that, thank you. Um, today, we wanna talk, talk to you about our five phase PDSA cycle where we added set the foundation as an important first phase of the work. So with that, we have set the foundation, plan, do, study, and act. And we're going to spend quite a bit of time today walking you through a scenario where you experience all four, um, or actually all five of these phases. So finally, I want to um, make sure that you have a chance to know just a little bit more about what we did and who we worked with. So it's important in particular to know who we worked with and where, because we worked with rural schools and rural districts in Eastern Kentucky. And it's important, you all are here at the National Rural Ed Conference, so you know that rural schools and districts often face limited resources. And because of that, it makes PDSA in particular a valuable strategy, a valuable resources that rural schools and districts can use so that they can leverage the resources that they have. And you're gonna be hearing about that in just a moment. So as I said, we worked with five entities in Eastern Kentucky. Um, you saw their photographs just a moment ago and who they were affiliated with. And uh, what we wanna do before we go any further is just pause so part of this deepness is knowing who they are and what their experience has been like. So what I'd like to do now is call on them one at a time. I'm gonna let you know I'm gonna call on Jackson Independent first, where we're gonna be hearing from Paul Green. And so Paul, what I'd like for you to do is introduce yourself, um, state the theme of the work with you, and then at least one thing that we've done that you think was really useful that you wanna to bring to the attention of other folks. So Paul, can I ask you to do that now? Well, hey, everybody. Um, so yeah, um, Jackson Independent is a very small, um, uh, independent district in Southeast Kentucky. Um, we um, joined with um, Rail Appalachia a couple years ago. We had some ideas about some things we wanted uh, to do. Uh, I, I've always been a believer that 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 our area and our rural community, we we deal with our students having to leave our area um, uh, to improve their lives, and we feel like that as a school district, we wanted to try to figure out ways to help our kids. Um, to be able to stay in our local communities. So um, it's been a really great partnership because we started out with this big eye broad idea, but really didn't know kind of where we wanted to go with it. And um, so with working with them and through 
logic models and you know the the the, the plan study do act um you know how how do we implement something like this what is the plan you know what is the research that would support some of the things that we would like to do um and and they've been great they've kept us on task um uh, you know for for me sometimes you have these you, you launch these initiatives and then they get you, they kind of get lost in the shuffle but by working through the, the the planning process having specific uh, timelines and being able to kind of keep your uh, focus on on this initiative, um, uh, you know, it, it can really help it move forward. Uh, unfortunately for us, we're kind of still in the middle of it. We're, we're still doing a lot of work. We want to do a lot of the work, but the pandemic has kind of short-circuited everything um, uh, for us. But uh, we're really excited about our, our initiative. It's actually called Jumpstart Jackson which is uh, our school district wanting to engage our local community to, um, to, to help uplift our community and actually make it a place that is a, is a more viable community that would provide greater opportunities for our kids uh, uh, in the future. So that's just a little bit about us. I know we just got a couple minutes each, so, uh, but I'd be um, uh, welcome to answer any questions or, or talk more about it if anybody had anything. Great, thank you so much, Paul. So from Paul, we're gonna to go to Principal Crum in Johnson Central High School. Principal Crum. Hello, uh, yeah, Noel Crum here at Johnson Central High School. And uh, our project is uh, about uh, developing student leadership. And we took a kind of a two-pronged uh, approach to that. We realized that we would need to, uh, you know, first provide the leadership support for our staff and train them and get them uh, in the, the right mindsets of, of um, current leadership research. And then uh, we've worked for the last, you know, three plus years really on trying to develop a student leadership model where we can uh, help empower our students to, um, you know, make better decisions, to be more motivated and to follow through and hopefully have uh, better post-secondary outcomes. And, uh, you know, we live in a very impoverished area and uh, we've got over 30% of our students in Johnson County are um, raised by grandparents and another 40% plus are in single parent or, or um, odd configurations in their home. Very, very few of ours are in a normal two parent home. So we realize that students aren't getting a lot of the normal uh, development that they would uh, possibly in um, uh, other, other areas of the country. Of course, we realize it's a growing problem. What I would like to say is that, um, you know, first of all, for anyone watching this, if you're not using um, the, the rail groups, you, you need to connect to those. I can't speak for others, but Rail Appalachia has been um, instrumental in us being able to complete this project. And um, I, I say that from multiple, you know, areas. You know, first of all, having the support of being able to provide factual resources and, and the, the information to validate your work is crucial and that's something that educators don't really have enough time to do on their own and getting that support has been huge for us. Uh, but also just the, the idea of being able to have a support structure to help um, navigate and stay on task and really try to make sure that we're getting the most out of our project. I can honestly say, I know Paul said a minute ago that you know with the pandemic, it's really set a lot of us back as I'm sure it has the rest of the country, but uh, were it not for you know Ashley um, you know, CJ and um, uh, Stephanie and really the whole group that's provided so much support for us. Um, I don't know how we would have gotten through these last few months and at least stayed on any any type of uh, thought process to try to provide the supports that we needed for our students. Uh, I, I can't say enough for um, Rail Appalachia and this whole process, but uh, we, we're excited about where we are. It's still a process. We've got a long ways to go, but we're, we're excited and, and appreciate all the support. Thank you. Thank you so much, Noel. We appreciate hearing that too. So next I'm gonna to turn to Jennifer Carroll at the Kentucky Valley Education Cooperative. Jennifer. Hi, um, yes, our role is a little bit different than the um, school leaders that you're hearing from. Um, the Kentucky Valley Educational Cooperative is a non-regulatory service agency that serves um, Eastern Kentucky. So where that arrow was pointing on this outline map, we serve 23 school districts um, in that area. So that's over 140 schools. 
um, and our um, geographic area, if you want a frame of reference, is um, we are larger than the size of the state of Connecticut in the service area that we um, that we support. So it's kind of a large area. So our cooperative, um, being non-regulatory, we place a very um, specific emphasis on helping our school districts to really um, capitalize on their strengths and their talents and their resources to be able to um, identify and develop solutions to their own problems of practice. So that work um, with the schools that you have on the call today and other schools across our region had already um, been initiated through a project that we call Activating Catalytic Transformation. But um, this, we were very blessed to have REL Appalachia and SRI International to um, make a connection with us um, because their work really did help you know, to talk about the takeaway. Their work, um, and, and specifically the people that are presenting on this session today, they have been blessings because they really have helped us to refine our protocols and our practices and our routines that we use with schools to support them in that work so that they truly are empowered to look at their own data to identify a problem of practice that exists within their school, that when that problem is solved, it will advance outcomes towards successful post-secondary transitions. And so they have helped inform our work as a cooperative and the future work that we will engage in with all of our schools and districts. So um, I echo what Paul and Noel have said so far in the fact that a partnership with um, REL Appalachia and SR International is truly um, beneficial. It has helped us um, as an agency and it will help us in our continued work with our um, schools and districts that, that we serve. So um, I just wanna give a shout out to those folks um, and, and their work and the folks that you're gonna hear from today in our, in our region that have participated in this initiative. They are amazing. Thank you so much. That's really nice to hear. We appreciate that so much. So now I'm gonna to turn to Principal Chris Meadows at McGoffin County High School. Chris, take it away. Hello, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. I think I would begin by echoing what Paul said about RELS help in helping us to narrow our focus. I think when we first started with the project, uh, it's easy to get lost in your problem. And uh, during that first actual face-to-face -face meeting, REL helped us to look at our data and to really streamline and focus uh, our problem of practice. And what we uh, arrived at was that uh, we have students that are chronically absent from school. And what type of an impact is that having on their post-secondary transitions? So we, uh, through our data analysis and through our uh, Plan Do Study Act, we began to look at ways that we could impact student engagement and also how that we could support those students academically through formative assessment, particularly in math classes. So on our team, uh, we had uh, myself as the principal and assistant principal and our math department chair, who is also an instructional coach to participate and guide this project for our school. One thing that I wanted to particularly point out that REL suggested that we do that I don't think that we would have ever thought of. And it was so eye-opening to us as a school. And that was the empathy interview. They suggested that we conduct empathy interviews with chronically absent students and to find out things um, that they liked about school or maybe things that were keeping them from school. And I think oftentimes we think as educators that perhaps it's the school or things in the school that might be keeping these students from coming to school. But what we found was so different. We found that students were missing school because they have um, financial issues. They had to work odd jobs to um, support families. We found that those same students when they're at school, they love being at school. They view staff members as family members. So, it helped us to see our students in a different light. And I don't know that uh, we would have arrived at that part of the project without REL's guidance. Um, I could speak to um, much of the other things as everyone else has concerning 
explain do study eight model, but I just wanted to point out that the empathy interview really helped us to understand our students and it will help us as we move forward. Thank you so much, Chris. It's nice to hear you guys echoing different pieces of our experiences together. Thank you so much. And Miss Ritchie sends her regrets. Unfortunately, she's not gonna be able to make it. She's a principal um, at Perry County High School. We've been working with her as well. Um, and we all understand because these are really hard days. So we understand her absence, but please know um, we have worked with her. And uh, that brings me to the next point. We work with Miss Ritchie, all the folks you heard from, and importantly, a team, and several of them commented on a team. You might have picked up on that. We encourage them to form a team at their school, and they did. And we want to encourage you to form a team at your school if you are undertaking any sort of PDSA or continuous improvement initiative or leverage one that already exists as you undertake that work. So be aware the team makes all the difference. The folks on your team can act as your change agents as you go out and do the work in your school with your students or with your all the folks in your district. Um, so just be aware of that. And you'll, you'll learn more about that as we continue today. So speaking of teams, we're going to be working in small groups that are really going to act like a team. So with that as a mindset, you now know who we are and a little bit about our experiences together and the lens we're bringing to this work. So before we go any further, we would like to know a little bit about who you are. So I'm gonna pause and I'm gonna ask each of you if you would say your name, put it in the chat for me, say your name, your role, and where you are. So you could be, put your school in the state, but because this is a national conference, we'd really like to know where you are too. So you could say school district, but be sure to include your state initials. So I'm gonna pause and let you all do that. Name, role, school or district, and then your state so that we can see where you're from. While you're putting that in the chat, I'm just gonna just echo what a couple of folks said. Wherever you are, you have a route and you saw that on the map. So please um, know that all of the RELs are offering services similar to what we offer. There's a research service available. So don't hesitate to reach out to your REL because RELs are here to serve folks like you who are working hard in your um, region. Victoria. Yes. I wanted to say something uh, as as well earlier that I, I didn't get to, uh, and I don't know, sure. you know if we have people from you know different areas of the country um, um, involved with this, but I, I, the other group I didn't get to really say a lot about is is Jennifer Carroll, um, Jeff Hawkins, uh, Desi Boeing, Bernadette, all the people at KVEC who, without their vision and their direction and in, uh, in helping all of our schools in uh, Eastern Kentucky try to uh, develop these projects and this whole act, uh, activating catalytic transformation process and, and many other things that were, were part of uh, a race to the top um, grant that they had secured many years ago. But I uh, just can't say enough about that. And if there's people from other parts of the country that are looking to see a model of how great things can happen um, you know, KVEC is doing that. And, um, you know, if, if, if there's other funding out there, or people that are looking to try to jump in and see a model that works, because that's what opened the door for all of this and for Aria, for Rail Appalachia to, to come in and help us, you know, connect and, and do all that it was through KVEC. So I just wanted to thank them. Great. I'm glad you did. And we thank them too, um, because they really made this connection possible. And, uh, helped us connect locally and it really made all the difference for us. And as folks are listening, uh, I think for all of us who are here. So we hope that those of you who are new to rail work are new to meeting those of us on this team. I recognize several of you. So glad to see you again. Please put your names in the chat as you get a chance to do so. And uh, I hope that you all leave the session today as excited as the principals and superintendent and locals you've heard from today. With that, Kathleen, I'm going to hand it over to you and ask you to walk us through building that foundation. Well, thank you, Victoria, and thanks to everyone who is attending this afternoon. And, you know, I'd like to begin to kind of set the stage for what we're going to do. We're going to look at each of those five phases and then we'll share some information and then we'll go to those breakout rooms. So you can actually engage with a tool or a process that we discuss. So you can kind of get your arms wrapped around all of this. And during this time, we encourage you to put questions or comments in the 
chat. We would love to make this as inter, uh, interactive as we possibly can, and also to better understand your needs. Now, during this process, and you heard uh, Victoria refer to a scenario, you're going to be introduced to a fictional high school called Deer View. And so you're going to see some samples and examples of work, and all of this refers to that fictional high school. So i um, just trying to get you to wrap your arms around what we're going to do this afternoon. So let's get started with that first phase. And we are going to uh, set that foundation for what we'll do in the PDSA cycle. And you know, we often think of the construction industry as analogous to education as both fields require kind of a methodical procedure that builds on one another. And we know that a weak foundation can result in failure of one or more critical components. So digging deeply into perceived needs and problems is certainly time well spent. And this is what we're gonna do during setting the foundation. We're gonna define the problem, create your theory of action, and then select an evidence-based practice. And please know that, you know, this takes uh, a period of a few weeks to really establish and work through. So as you're thinking about your timeline for improvement, please know it's not going to happen in one afternoon. You're going to need a little bit of time to get this work together. So for our first step, we're going to define the problem. And you know, the use of data for decision making is truly a hallmark of the improvement process. And to make the best decisions possible, you need multiple types of data. And you can see on our slide, we've got attendance, dropout rates, state assessments, graduation rates, family engagements, you know, many different types. We urge you, please resist the urge to rely solely on student achievement data for decision making. You know, this one type of data uh, just provides a single perspective. And this one type of data alone may limit your perception of how various student groups experience learning at your school. Um, now, if you're facilitating a data process, uh, we hope that you can compile that data in a way that will help your team. If you create, take that data and create charts and graphs, it'll help the members view variations in the data a little bit more quickly. And as you're going through that data process, we want your team to make descriptive statements about what they see in the data and then pose questions. And it's these statements and questions that are gonna form the basis of that problem statement. Now, once you've got your problem statement, you need to dig a little bit deeper. And we encourage you to consider using that five wise uh, process. You may have heard that quote. It's often attributed to Edwards Demons, Demings that every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. And in this part of the process, we're trying to get to the system. So what are the the policies, the practices, the processes that are contributing to these undesired student outcomes. You know, we have a template that will kind of guide us through and here's that five wise template. And that'll help us dig in by simply asking why five times. I know it sounds pretty basic, but I tell you what, it really helps you get down to the root of it. And when digging into root causes, it's just important to keep discussions, focus on the reasons within a school's control. Again, that's those policies, procedures, instructional practices, you know, rather than reasons beyond the school's purview, such as student characteristics or family backgrounds. Certainly, we all know that many variables can affect student outcomes. But we've got to remain focused on what the school can control and what offers a viable approach. And so this is something we'll use to help us today in those breakout sessions. You know, once you've finally gotten your uh, problem statement um, in place, you want to finalize it. And you see two on your slide, two problem statements. First one is really just too vague. Students are not graduating from high school, college, and career ready. See, that doesn't help lead us to any action steps. What are we going to do 
What will we know to do? That second um, problem statement is much more specific. Students are not prepared um, for post-secondary transition due to inadequate development of academic and non-academic competencies. This statement helps us better align what's happening during their years in high school and then leading to that post-secondary transition. So once we've gotten our problem statement finalized, we go to step two, and that's creating your theory of action. And that theory of action is a graphical representation of your improvement initiative, and it helps your team articulate how school resources and actions lead to those desired outcomes. And we have a template that we can share with you. And you can see that the first thing that we did was to write down our problem statement right at the top. We want everything else we do to line back to that problem statement. And then we'll start adding in our inputs. Uh, we'll find that evidence-based practice that we intend to implement. And we'll have on this representation, our short, mid, and long-term outcomes. I wanna point out a couple of things. Look at those mid and long-term outcomes. And Ryoko, if you could just go back one slide, please. Thanks so much. Those uh, long and mid-term outcomes are student outcomes. And so we're gonna think long range for those. But that short-term outcome is typically associated with educator outcomes. And so those educator outcomes are gonna help us get to the mid and the long-term outcomes. Okay, let's go ahead. So as we start with our, our long-term outcomes, we're gonna use that backward design approach and kind of think you know, to yourself or with your team, if our improvement effort works just as planned, how will student outcomes change in the next three years? You know that to really make measurable changes in student outcomes long-term, it may take up to three years to occur. And then we think about those midterm outcomes. You know, um, that may take one to two years to actually reach those midterm outcomes. Again, these are both student-related and we'll need to hit those midterm outcomes before we can certainly address those long-term outcomes. Let's go to the short-term outcomes. Now, as I shared with you, those short-term outcomes are educator focused. And we know that changes in student outcomes are prompted by adult behaviors and actions. So as we think about our short-term health, uh, outcomes, we've got to consider who within the school, is it the administrator, the teacher, the counselor, who has the greatest opportunity to influence the desired uh, student outcomes. And these individuals become recognized as our change agents. And these change agents are the ones that we identify those short-term outcomes for. And in this example, you can see that the primary change agent is the teacher because that, uh, that person, that teacher, will ha likely have the greatest effect on improving student academic achievement. And two goals were uh, identified there. And those are both in helping students build relationships and helping students understand why what they're learning is important and how it will relate at the, uh, as they transition to post-secondary, and also helping students be more aware of, of where they are in the learning process. What do they know and what are they still needing to work on? So you can also see at this point in time, we started to list our inputs and we've put these things together. And so next we need to find what is the evidence-based practice we're gonna to use to help us get to these outcomes. And, you know, we've got to uh, put together a list. And again, please think about the data. Don't just jump in there to solutions. You'll need to really compile a list of options to consider. You know, is it a multi-tiered system of support? Is it gonna be those formative assessment practices? 
Is it maybe something like social emotional learning blocks? Whatever it is, we need to take it through a vetting process. And, you know, we encourage your team to start certainly by thinking about those four uh, levels of evidence that we find in ESSA. You know, through ESSA, they've provided levels of evidence around evidence-based practices from strong all the way to, you know, demonstrates a, a rationale. And that's one thing that you can check along the way to see, you know, the, the practice that you're considering, where it fits in these four levels of evidence. Certainly, we encourage you to think about the stronger ones because that's more associated with the likeliness of reaching those student outcomes that you, you want. Um, you can reach out to regional groups to help you maybe identify these practices or your uh, RELs in your region or what works clearinghouse but uh, really think through that practice you want to identify. And once you've got your list, you need to vet that list. And uh, we've put together two tools for you that you might wanna consider to vet, uh, to vet your practices. Uh, one is that hexagon uh, exploration tool. And that was developed by the National Implementation Research Network and the Frank, Lord, uh, Frank Porter Graham Child Development Institute at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And this exploration tool actually allows uh, you to investigate six in indicators. You'll see those three in green and they're specific to the practice. Does it have the evidence base you need? Is it easily usable? Are there supports to help you implement it? And then those blue indicators are site specific. Does it fit well with your other initiatives? Is it actually gonna address your need? And do we have the capacity um, to implement that practice? You know, the other tool we have on this slide is uh, the applicability of evidence-based interventions. And that was put together by our colleagues at RHEL West. And that's another tool that can really help you think through your practice and consider if it's right for your site. And it also uh, prompts you to consider things like additional cost and staff time and professional development needs and all of that. So, um, you know, this has been about setting that foundation, really building the base so that as you start that plan, do, uh, study, act cycle, you've got something strong to start with. Um, we're going to be moving into our breakout groups and we're going to be using a couple of these practices and tools along the way. And um, I'm going to introduce a little bit to you and, and then after a while you'll get the, the idea of uh, a link or you'll see a prompt to help you join one of the breakout rooms and, and we'll go there. So, so today in our breakout session, we're going to start by thinking about data and what data is useful in identifying our problem of practice. And we're also going to engage in that root cause analysis. And I'd like to introduce you to our fictional high school called Deerview High School. It's a small rural school uh, district with one comprehensive high school, a technical school, one middle school, and uh, four elementary schools. It has about 575 students across grades nine through 12. And they're about 67%, so a high percentage of students that qualify for the federal school lunch program. Um, Deerview offers a couple of advanced placement courses, extracurricular um, activities and clubs and sports. And I can imagine that maybe that sounds familiar to a lot of you, a very typical. Uh, rural school, if there is such a thing, it's typical these days. Okay, let's look at this. Now I'm going to remind our team that in a few minutes, we're going to jump into these small breakout rooms. You're actually going to get a workbook. There'll be a link in the chat so that you will see this link to, uh, to open up a workbook that you'll be able to use. And uh, that'll be there and ready for you. 
and we'll work for about 15 minutes on some uh, data analysis. And then we'll go for uh, about 10 minutes on our uh, root cause analysis. So guys, anything else that I've forgotten? I don't think so. When you see this, um, for, you'll be able to jump into that breakout room and get your workbook. So yeah, we want to get back to uh, just learn a little bit or have one thing to share that maybe uh, was an aha. And we're going to ask each of the groups to share that one little thing and then we'll move forward. So um, let's see, somebody that was maybe in Ryoko's group. Is there someone who will share? I forgot to do that too, to ask someone <laughs> to volunteer um, to share. Oh, so yay. I don't know if Cheryl or Jamie wants to share. Um, otherwise, I can obviously uh, share or CJ can share. But what about um, uh, Victoria, you said you had someone in your group. Thank you for being so diligent to do that. <laughs> We do have one, so we'll go first, um, and you guys can maybe think about volunteering uh, someone from either of those two groups. So Paul, do you wanna take it away? Yeah, so, I mean, we had some good conversation. I think the big thing for us is, is we, you know, we were already starting to, to work through the problem and, and, and trying to figure out solutions. And I think the, for us, while we had some data to work with, the big thing was, is we wanted more data we wanted more information. We wanted more of that student perception data to be able to, to, to drill deeper into some of the, the, the issues that we were seeing with the school, the reason for their, you know, the achievement gap, the, the low achievement numbers, you know, why was that going on? You know, we talked a, a lot about, you know, the, the one or the couple questions that were the perception data. Why did so many of the students uh, never want to um, seek out uh, help? And then, of course, when we got into the five whys, we ran out of time because we were already drilling into, you know, the reasons why that um, uh, students had performed lower, what were some of these issues. And so we were, we were working our way through it. So um, for us, I think it was a good exercise that we, we were making progress. But I think um, because we didn't have, you know, coming as educators, we know our students, we know our schools. So we have a, lo we have a little bit more of that anecdotal um, information to draw from. So in this case, it was a little bit more difficult, but uh, just understanding that through this process, we were already starting to, to see some things, um, some, some more clarity, but also more, more areas that we just needed more information. Thank you so much, Paul. And I think what you said, ask the students, you know, what's working well, what's not working well, you're going to learn a lot of information, getting some of that perception data. I will share, Kathleen. Um, Thank you. I, I, one of the things that we talked about in the group, just like um, what Paul said, and um, is we, we wanted more data um, just because that's us, we're educators. So we're always wanting to know more data. But uh, one of the things that I mentioned is I would like to know more about the intersections of data. So, you know, we, we have a little bit about that perception data, but those students who were not, um, graduating on time or they were not on track to graduation. I would like to know a little bit more about their perceptions. I would like to know a little bit more about where they were with their, um, their algebra and their um, ELA proficiency. So really looking at intersections of data instead of just kind of looking at it in its own chunks. I think that would tell us a little bit more about the problem. Um, but then um, we, were we were starting to have a really good conversation when the time was up around, you know, how important it is to take this all the way through the five Y process so that you're not going down too far down the wrong rabbit hole. Um, it would be really easy to stop at the third Y and think, oh, this is it. This is the, this is the problem and start putting resources and supports around it when really you, you needed to go a little bit deeper. So I, I think, um, you know, that conversation is really important and worth having. Thank you so much, Jennifer. You know, I want to give you just a little bit of an update on Deerview and let you know how this scenario moved forward. You know, this is uh, some of the data that they were looking at, and they too had a lot of questions and, and all about that. They did decide, and this is kind of to pro provide framework so that as you go into the next phases, you have a 
you have a, a reference point, but uh, they did identify their problem uh, statement as students are not prepared for post-secondary transition due to inadequate development of academic and non-academic competencies. And what they decided was that they would select formative assessment practices as that uh, evidence-based uh, practice to implement. Now, what's really important is they decided to start very small. They decided to, smart, to start only with a group of math teachers, their geometry teachers and to focus on formative assessment with those geometry teachers so that they could kind of work out all the kinks before they moved it into the entire uh, staff. So as we move forward into the next plan, do, study, and act, you're going to hear about these geometry teachers and the plan they put forward to implement formative assessment. So Ashley, all I right. think you're up. Thank you. Uh, so now that we have worked our way through all of the setting the foundation, we have a strong foundation, we've chosen an evidence-based practice, we're ready to start the plan phase or to start building a blueprint for our project. As with any construction project, we need a detailed blueprint to guide our work. Taking the time to plan for our improvement initiative is time well invested. So there are three steps to doing this work. First, list the action steps. Second, identify the data to collect. And third, make predictions. We'll step through each of these quickly. This is a template we're gonna use throughout the plan phase. And we'll even add to it in future phases. We'll talk through each step and then I can share a completed example for all of us to see in just a moment. The first thing to do is list your action steps. During this phase, you figure out the activities needed to implement the selected evidence-based practice. We'll spend some time thinking about the who, what, when, and where of our action plan. And again, we're doing all of this as a team. We're not just assigning people who aren't in the room to participate. Uh, write down each step. It's a great way to keep your team on track. We heard some of the principals at the beginning say, just having the structure I know they thanked us and they said it was working with Rail Appalachia. It's really this right here that it makes it successful. It's writing down each steps. It's a great way to keep your team on track and set yourself up for the upcoming phases of the PDSA cycle. So next up, after we write down our uh, action steps, we need to figure out how we're going to assess our improvement effort. How do we know if this is even working, what we're doing? Identifying the data you'll monitor and when you're creating your plan, will set you up for greater success. Here you want to consider two kinds of data. First, implementation data. What checkpoints do we have to know if we're accomplishing our action steps? So this could be really simple data like teachers showed up for the PD, or it can be even a little more advanced like uh, teachers filling out an exit survey from professional development uh, to report their takeaways. How do we know that what we're doing is um, that people are participating and that they're getting something from it? The second kind of data you wanna track is your outcome data. What data do we need to collect to know if this is working as intended? Outcomes data are usually connected to the changes you wanna see. So for our Deerview teachers who want to change something in the classroom, you might look for changes in their lesson plans or what they're doing in the classroom. Okay, then on to the third step, making predictions. The last step in this plan is to make predictions. We set our steps identified the data to monitor. And now we have to ask ourselves, what do we think we're gonna see in these data? What would we call success? How will this activity actually play out? This is a critical part of the plan phase as it sets up the process for the continuous improvement cycle. Checking what we learn against our prediction in the future steps will help us quickly learn what worked and what didn't work. So we really need to take the time to do this in our plan. Think of it like kids in a science class doing um, the, using the scientific method. This is your hypothesis. This is what we're gonna test against to know if it's working or not working in the study phase. So you may make a prediction for each step or if more appropriate, you make predictions across multiple steps. And here's our Deerview, here are our friends at Deerview High School and their plan. Uh, remember that the team there de decided to focus on formative assessment. So this table is only a portion of the planning template I've removed the who and where parts so you can see more detail. 
I can tell you though, that the who are the 10th grade geometry teachers. They decided that when would be October and November that they'd work on this and where was regular team meetings and staff meetings. So here's what they came up with for those 10th grade teachers. The team members detailed action steps uh, for how they would learn to communicate learning expectations, motivate student understanding, gather evidence and use formative assessment feedback. The team also developed plans for collecting evidence they decided that the, the data they would collect would be both through interviews and lesson plans. And finally, they predicted the changes they would see in teacher behaviors. This plan is going to be used across all future phases of the PDSA, starting with the do phase next. So we're ready to do, Ryoko. All right, so now it's my turn, thank you. So the do phase, all right, here we go. Um, so, I'm a former special education teacher, so I'm going to talk a lot about special education. So I hope some of you guys also are like me with some special education training. So a lot of times when we think of do as educators, this is where we first go to. We're going to do it. But remember, we just finished step phase one, which is setting the foundation, and then the plan phase, phase uh, which is two, with the blueprint, right? And so just like using the same analogy of building a house or in a construction project, we're now gonna use the blueprint to build the house, right? And so we're gonna implement the action steps, but we're now also gonna monitor the data. And so this is the part where unlike just teaching, we're gonna also be cognizant of monitoring the data because this is part of the continuous improvement cycle, which is a scientific method. Right? Because in the plan phase, we just started to hypothesize. And without the data, we can't study it. So just like um, the action plan template that Ashley uh, just talked about, it's literally codifying who's doing what. So I always get in trouble when I assume when someone knows what they're going to do. And this is the kind of tool where it looks so simple and yet it's really great to make sure everyone knows what they're doing. With a target person, that target person is gonna do this thing and it's gonna start end. And in leading PLCs, I will tell you for an hour, I had a couple of teachers because I didn't specify a location. It took them 30 minutes to find the location. I'm never gonna do that again, right? So specify the location. So you're just gonna do it. You're gonna implement what you just said you were gonna do in the plan phase. Here's the thing, and you have to remember to collect implementation and outcome data. So this is a tracker, a data tracker. Uh, that's a really helpful tool as well because you wanna make sure that you specify who's collecting the implementation data and the outcome data and at what date you're gonna collect it. And this is part of the systematic data collection process. So again, our friends at Deerview High School. So the implementation checkpoint, we've got three math teachers in this high school. We got Ms. Neal, Mr. Knowles, and Ms. Rydell. So the district has a school improvement specialist, Ms. Hale, that's her name. Uh, of course it's fake, but you get the drift. So Ms. Hale is going to interview these three teachers as part of the implement, implementation checkpoints on these dates. The outcome data, because Ms. Neal is the math chair of her school, she's going to have herself and the two other math uh, teachers put their lesson plans in a share folder for these weeks. And notice how, while it's simple, because it's explicit, we can all put it on our calendars. It's a really good communication tool. All right, so we just finished do, and you've got some data. So now we're moving into the study phase. Ooh. There we go. All right, so the study phase, let's go back to our house. So the study phase, right? So now you built the house. So anyone who's done an addition knows that you can't totally live back into your house in this new addition without the county doing the inspection, right? And when the county does the inspection, it's, did you follow your blueprint? Because your blueprint got approved. So 
that inspector isn't coming into your house like a decorator to say, ah, oh, you should have put lights under that countertop. What they're doing is saying, your plan, did you do what you said you did? And they're comparing your house with your plan. And that's what the study phase is. You're gonna compare the initial predictions with what actually happened, and then you identify patterns. And so we're just growing that action plan template that Ashley shared, where we left off with, in the plan phase, the predict, right? what we predict is gonna happen. Now that you have the data, now it's what actually happened. So you're gonna analyze data and then report, this is what happened. And you're gonna just describe, just like in Dragnet, just the facts, ma'am. You're just gonna describe what happened. And so this phase in study, it's looking at the action steps, what was planned and what actually happened. And when you're doing this, here's the thing, right? And then again, even if you have the same students in your classroom, tomorrow can be another day with different challenges. And so this is where you also wanna think about what could affect the implementation or outcomes. So then we're gonna review what we just saw with Ashley presenting on, so Deerview High School, right? They did formative assessment. Teachers were trained on formative assessment. And so the first part is they're gonna learn how to clarify and communicate learning expectations and how to motivate. The data were interviews and lesson plans. And so the prediction was, this is, this is gonna be so easy for teachers. We as teachers know how to do this, we know how to motivate, right? All the teachers should, this is review for them, they should be able to do it. All right, so in our breakout session, we're gonna talk about interpreting data. So what I want you guys to take away with in this breakout session is first think about the data you already have and then you're gonna learn how to analyze that data for improvement, again, not for accountability, but it's really for improvement as educators. And that's what I feel like we do when we talk about data. So you just heard, right, uh, Kathleen, Chris uh, at McGoffin High School, they may say data and I say data, but we say the same words and it could mean different things depending on the hat you wear in this umbrella of education. So now that I do research, my researcher hat, when I think of data, I'm thinking right, statewide data of 93,000 kids because my intention, my purpose is to generalize my research findings. But a principal uses the word data and it's for their for his or her school. So let's say 528 kids in their school. And a lot of times the purpose is for accountability. But I want us to also have that teacher hat when we're thinking about improvement. So when I was a special ed teacher, let's say I have 10 kids in my uh, self-contained classroom. Each kid has an individualized education plan, which means each kid, I have to do some assessments, I had observations. And so for me, data was N of one. So I'm focusing on Jane in my classroom, thinking about how I can improve her reading scores. That's also data. And so data in education, we have so much of it. So we don't need to be actually adding on new data. Like we need to do more surveys. Let's survey some more kids to figure out what the problem is. Look at the data you actually already have. So for Deerview, this is where we purposely said, here's these two sets of data. For the implementation checkpoints, they just ask teachers, right? In PLC meetings or whatever, it's great opportunities. You don't need an extra time to do it. Just interview teachers. Hey, how did it go? For outcome data, because the short-term outcomes are educators and the micro movements that educators do, you know we all have to do it as educators, is lesson plans. Just use that as data. Right, so it's like friends don't let friends think that to get data, you need to get new things. The first thing I always hear when we start this is, let's do a survey. And a lot of times I'll have to say, well, let's look at what data you already have. And we tend to have a lot already in education. 
So during our breakout, we're gonna fill in this gold box. So we saw that in Deerview, we've got Mr. Knowles, Rydell, and Ms. Neal. They went through professional development for formative assessment. They're gonna use formative assessment in their classroom. And we predicted that totally easy stuff. They'll, these teachers are able to clarify and communicate learning expectations and they'll know how to motivate. This is what we do, right, as educators. So our prediction during the plan phase, all of them in their lesson plans are gonna show that they you know, are using formative assessment in their classroom. So we're gonna look at interview data and lesson plan data to go through this column for study, which is study results for data. All right, 25 minutes. The first five minutes, we'll review the data. And then 10 minutes, 10 minutes, we'll look at interview data and then lesson plan data. And we will have the facilitators go through uh, this exercise with you in our breakout session. So hang tight as we go to our next breakout session. All right, we should all be back. So again, power of one, one aha, one minute with our breakout. And luckily, I think we only have two, right? Breakout rooms. So why don't we start with uh, my breakout room and Victoria has graciously offered to share. One aha in one minute. The one aha. So <clears throat> we had more than one aha. The group had a very uh, rich discussion. People were very thoughtful about the reviewing the interviews with the teachers. People emphasized the variation across all three. I think if I were to have to pick the biggest aha, it came from the superintendent in our group who recognized that the teacher who had been teaching for such a long time and was really didn't have his heart in it could easily be in compliance with his lesson plans, if you will. And uh, so if the principal goes by and checks, he's got everything documented, he's doing his formative assessment, but at the end of the day, his heart and soul is carrying out in the classroom, really isn't implementing the intent of formative assessment in the way in which the professional development and the leadership team of the school play it. And so you have to really take that extra step to interview teachers and go the extra mile, do the observations more than once to see what's really happening. Oops, one more thing. And you need to look at students, changes in student achievement. There, stop. Fantastic. It was under one minute. All right, how about the other group? So I'm not sure who would like to um, start. Okay, we also, I'll go ahead and share. Um, you know, we really had a really rich conversation as well and talked about the difference, differences in the teachers. There was a lot of discussion about Ms. Rydell and being a brand new teacher and the need when you're doing this to make sure you're in a safe environment, that you have the opportunity to try something, to not really do very well on it and to be able to, to work at it again. So especially in that situation with a new teacher, it was so important to uh, have a safe situation there. We also realized that you know our predictions uh, we thought it would be something that would happen very easily, but we realized it was more complex than we thought. And, um, you know, that it was something where we needed to have a little more clarity about formative assessment itself and what the evidence might mean and then how to go forward. So, um, you know, looking at this kind of data was a little bit different for most in the group. And so we were thinking it could be a good part of a process. Great. So again, I wanna leave with data's all around us. So think about how a lot of the different things that you already do, whether it's PLC meetings, walkthroughs for your teachers, all of these things that we already do, how that can be used for the school improvement process or the continuous improvement process. All right. So now we're gonna move on to our final act with Victoria. Great, perfect. So thank you everybody. So this is the final act um, and it is the final phase where we're going to act. We've been planning and doing and studying. Now it's time to take some action. 
So with that, there are two big things we wanna make sure that we are able to get done. Um, after we've done all the hard work, you brought up your sleeves, here we are, now what are we gonna do? So the first thing we want you to do is really be thoughtful about what have you learned? So um, as we enter our next small breakout group, we're gonna be really taking a moment to reflect and think about what did we learn? And then after we've done that, and after you do that with your teams back home, the thing you would wanna do is be reflective and say, what do I do now? So what will my next steps be? What's appropriate? Are there adjustments or changes or adaptations that I wanna make? Um, and then what kinds of improvements to our own processes and ways of doing business is it gonna be important to do? So as before, we are continuing down that template. We have copies for you in the template of all the templates at the back of your workbook. So be sure and download that from the session because the resources are all there for you. And I think you'd wanna be able to see them and use them on your own. So as we get to this next step, you see on the template, we have this final column now shaded in green about what's next. And here's where you're going to write down your revisions and any improvements that are really the action steps that you're gonna take um, from all of the learnings you have. So then finally, we have this template. We think it's really important to give you templates like this, the one you just saw where we were, as you, if you didn't notice, as we moved through each of the phases, we were shading in green where you were going to be taking your action in that phase. Same here on the slide I just showed you. Now this template we're sharing now is a place where we have a series of guiding questions or scaffolded questions for you about what did we learn when we studied the data and the information? What kinds of revisions should we make to our processes? Then thinking about it in terms of what to do immediately. When I originally described and introduced you to the PDSA cycle, I said it's, it's really rapid cycle and can, um, if rapid cycle reflection so that you could really stop, look back, and then decide what adaptations or changes you want to make. And this is where we're wanting you to do that and document it. And then think about, as I said, the immediacy of what you will do in the short term based on what you just experienced. And then some things may need to take a longer time. And so you wanna be able to think through that and differentiate it in a, a table like this one, or at least a conversation that you have with your team back home. As we move ahead, what you'll see on the next slide is that as you think about working with your team, one way that you wanna guide your team through interpreting the data is to use a discussion protocol, much like I was just guiding you through. So you can work through these questions and then use them to surface and synthesize what you've learned. You can compare the prediction as we emphasized a few minutes ago to the actual and discuss insights and whatever it is new that you've been learning. So these are gonna take the time to record in the table that you've been building all throughout the cycle. So you'll see a discussion protocol to use um, when we move into our small breakout groups. You can synthesize the new learnings and just be careful, resist the urge to plan next steps when you're in the table because you're gonna to get to that in just a moment. So as Ryoko has on screen, this is gonna be the column you're gonna be using when we move into the breakout groups for the first thing that you're going to be doing. So I think we're down to about 15 minutes, maybe just a little bit less at this point. So we're gonna roughly do 10 minutes to, to finish out the protocol five minutes to review what Deerview decided so that you have the, the completion of the example available to you. So what about from the other group? Who's gonna share out from that? Kathleen, Ashley? Is well, <laughs> we, I don't think we identified anyone just yet. <laughs> I, I'll take one, I'll take this one. Uh, so our team, uh, we came to a lot of the same conclusions that Deerview had come to already, but one new learning for myself was that we'd been looking at uh, Mr. Knowles and thinking, this guy is just not on board. But in the next steps and the actions for what Deerview did, it was enlightening to me to see how they 
didn't say it's that guy. They said, it's this context. It's about the time. And it's, we have the best assumptions about everyone on the team that they're doing well. So what is it about the context and the request that we need to modify so that everyone can participate? And so changing the timeline, the timing of how frequently you had to update your lesson plans might uh, yield better results for us. And so I, that was a good shift in my thinking. Um, instead of just looking at the guy across the room and thinking, what's going on over there? To actually find practical approaches that would work for everyone and look at the system, not the person. So thank you both groups for reporting out and thank you for the discussions that you were having and that you've had all afternoon with us, thank you. So let's just pause for just a second to think about what would be appropriate thing for dear view uh, school improvement team to, to be for them to decide to do. What should they do? And here we've got different uh, stoplights uh, representing actions they could take. Here we've got green for go all out. Just launch the initiative in full in your school, go nuts, you know, full speed ahead. That's one option. Another one would be to be more cautious, yield. That's why we have the yellow light here and say, wait, we should try this again with the same teachers, test it at least one more time so that we can be sure that we are having all those teachers come along before we just press go and bring everybody into this. Or the last option would be stop. Here we were showing you the red stoplight to say, no way, formative assessment doesn't work in my school. It's really a bad idea. Wait, let's go back to the drawing board and pick out something else to do. Well, as you'll see, if you keep reading in your workbook, um, jo uh, Jody basically hit the nail on the head uh, because in our storyline, Deerview decided to proceed cautiously. Um, they were not gonna switch and they're not gonna take it full, school, full scale within the school. So thank you, Jody. Um, and thank you for the tip to add the blinking light. And so that's our message to you on continuous improvement overall. Don't stop believing. It does just go on and on and on, and it is a continuous improvement process forever because once you work on one thing, you can move right on to the next. So you take all the skills you learn and apply them to the next thing you're gonna tackle. So don't stop believing, and thank you for staying with us. CJ, I'm gonna turn it to you now to do our wrap up. Yeah, thank you, Victoria. So we're gonna wrap up real quick right now. Um, look for a link in the chat for a survey, one of the things we wanna do is get some feedback from you all about how this session went. And so we'd really appreciate it if you would um, provide us some feedback so we can grow as well. So I just wanted to quickly go over an overview of today's content. So we learned a little bit about what continuous improvement is. We went through a five step cycle of continuous improvement that begins with setting the foundation, then setting out a plan then actually acting on that plan. Then we study that plan. And then we decide, how are we gonna act with these new learnings? What are we gonna do next? And then we start that cycle all over again with our new adjustment. So what's next slide? And the last thing is, you know, we shared a lot with you today and we're sending you, well, you'll be able to download these materials. I believe they're posted on the um, interactive website for the conference. So you'll be able to get these. And we would ask that you think about how you might share this with your team to address a problem locally. And so what we're really helping, hoping is that you kind of take these tools and use them. And so if anyone has any ideas about who they would share them with or a problem that they might address with them, we'd like to hear from you and for you to put them in the chat. I'll say that, um with all the remote learning we've all been experiencing that this continuous improvement process, I think I'll share with some of the schools I work with, this is one way to get quick information and pivot quickly in, in uncertain, quickly changing instructional times. But this is one good process to figure out what is working to engage students and keep learning going. Okay, and another reminder about the survey that Stephanie just put in the chat. So please, please fill it out for us. Um, and that's it for our session. If you want to learn more about our work um, at REL Appalachia, there's a link to our post-secondary transition, transitions partnership. And there's also a site for REL Appalachia overall. You can follow us on Twitter or email us. We really want to hear from you. Um, 
And especially for folks who happen to live in our service area, we can help you directly or send you to a REL that serves you in your area. And so we really appreciate it for all of you that stuck with us for three hours on this uh, Thursday afternoon. And we hope that it was beneficial and a good learning experience for everyone. Thank, Thank you, care, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. It was good to Thank see all you, of everyone. Yes. Great Thank to see you. so many. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.